Hello everyone, it is time for our weekly live stream. So every Saturday at 2 o'clock, 208 <laughs> Central Time, I start our stream and we talk about a topic for about 45 minutes or so, and then we go into a question and answer. Uh, one of the things I want to mention to you is, because some people don't realize it when they come into the stream, they think I'm ignoring them. I'm not. I'm talking about the topic, and then when I get to your questions, I will definitely answer them, but I'm usually about 20 minutes behind your question, so you need to stick around. Uh, I usually recommend that if you want me to see your question, do at Mila's Reef and then write your question, and that way it'll bubble up to the top, so to speak, and I can see it stand out between the conversation you guys have amongst yourselves sometimes. Today's topic, oh, let me say hi to a few people. So Michael was the first one here. No, Joshua was the first one here. <laughs> good job, Josh. You beat, you beat everybody. Uh, let me look at my volume. That looks good, and uh, there's a tree behind me. <laughs> so we are heading into Merry Christmas season. Uh, I was very happy to get this tree. I, uh, I like getting them from Costco because there's one giant truck, that show, a semi-truck, shows up full of trees, and you have one day to get those tree, and we were there first thing in the morning. We were the first person to get the first tree, and it ended up being really pretty, and we already filled up with all of our decorations, and now we just got to shove a ton of presents under there, and we're ready. <laughs> so this is a lot of fun. Uh, it's nice to decorate the house and change it. You may notice that that wall is no longer yellow. Uh, my girlfriend said, I don't want that to be yellow anymore. <laughs> so we are working all the yellow out of the room and we're switching it to gray. And that is what it's going to be. Oh, funny uh, thing I got to tell you last night. So she's asleep and I turn on the TV and I found something on, um, I think it was HBO Max. And it was like Undiscovered Mysteries or something like that. And uh, so it's showing corals and the ocean and you know, there's anemones and there's shrimp. And she wakes up and she sees the screen and she says, why did you put porn on? <laughs> and I totally told her I was gonna tell everyone today what she said. So yeah, that happened, that was hilarious. And we ended up watching the entire thing and getting super excited about all the things we could identify that were in the ocean in this uh, filmography, do documentary, I don't know what you wanna call it, but it sure was nice to see a lot of the creatures that we keep in our tanks as well as those bigger ones that we never would ever buy. So that was fun and uh, I highly recommend it. Ended up leaving the TV on all night and we went through about four of those. <laughs> I slept through three, but you know, still, it's really nice to see nature, especially these days when we're trapped inside our homes, we're trying to not to get sick and we are, uh, you know, trying to make ends meet. So it's, it's a tricky situation these days. It's been rough all year, the year's almost over. I'm hoping 2021 will be better. We'll see. Um, and uh, yeah. so my topic today is what about those annoying things that break on your tank? And really, when do you need to address them? Or when should you jump on the situation? Because it happens to, it's been happening to me a lot lately <laughs> where something breaks and I'm just like, oh, again, what is wrong now? And it's another thing that I have to deal with. And, you know, I prefer to just not deal with anything and just enjoy my reef. And so having to get over there and take it down, unplug it, unscrew it, you know, just investigate. It's never something simple like plug it out, not unplug it, plug it in. It's never that. But uh, let's see, there's a whole list of things that have gone wrong in the last week that has irritated me. I had a metal highlight bulb just stop for no reason whatsoever. And I'm almost, well, I'm about 99% sure I replaced that bulb and the ballast at the same time about a month ago. So for that bulb to fail, let's call it prematurely, was really annoying. And I ignored it for two or three days. And then finally, I climbed up there and I swapped out the bulb with another bulb because I always have a backup. And the light came right on. So apparently it was a bad bulb. And I watched my really pretty, really pretty chalice do this very strange thing where it was exuding zoanthelli out of every single one of its mouths all at the same time. So it was like this brown string coming out of every bit of the coral. And I thought, well, you know, the lights were off for roughly, you know, that light was off for about three days. So it wasn't getting baked with 400 watts of light. And I just thought, is it dying? Is that brown jelly disease? <laughs> and so I kind of kept an eye on it. And I, basically it was just the light change made this coral say, I don't need this zoanthelli and just spit it all out. But the coral's still perfect. So it was just one of those little things that, you know, if you wait too long, if you ignore it or if you procrastinate, you may see a response from your corals and it may not be an easy response, it might be a bad one. So that's why you have to ask yourself, how critical is this to the life support of the tank or can it wait a few days? You know, can it wait till you have time to deal with it? 
I uh, got that handled. And then, let's see, what else is wrong? My Trident had a problem, and I still haven't bothered to figure that one out, which I need to do. It's on my list of things to do. Uh, it's just not measuring something, so it's sitting idly. And uh, then uh, yesterday, the top off wasn't topping off. <laughs> So I manually turned it to on, and then I forgot about it, and it filled too much. And then the protein skimmer started making a noise I've never heard before, and I've had the same skimmer for, you know, the NIOS 300. I've had it for, I don't know, four or five years. And the air silencer was bubbling, which is weird. Basically, it filled with water, and then as it's sucking air in, it's creating this weird bubbling effect inside there, so it kind of looked like it was boiling, inside a spot that should never ever be wet. So I thought, now what's wrong? <laughs> now that one I could attribute to over overfilling the sump with too much top off water. And so I think that's what happened. I basically dried it out, drained it, got it back to normal, and uh, then it stopped. But I had to get on my hands and knees and figure out what's going on. And that was one of those things like, I just want to enjoy the movie. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with this thing right now. So. The rule of thumb when it comes to repairs on your tank is number one, assess what the situation is. And then number two, determine how long, I mean, you have to mentally know this. And if you don't know it, you need to jump on it. But if you, you've got some experience in the hobby, you need to know how long do you really have to address this situation before it becomes a problem. And if you say, well, you know, my auto feeder's not working, but I can feed manually three times a day, so it's fine, then you just deal with it whenever. But if it was like the thing that doses your alkalinity several times a day and suddenly it stopped or it ran out of fluid and you just ignored it for three or four days, you could lose your reef because alkalinity would plummet to the point where the corals starve out what they need and they just start falling apart. So it has to be one of those things where you decide what's more important versus what's just you know a nuisance. Um, and there's a whole plethora of, you know, of things that you could need to repair. You know, I mean, from the top to the bottom, whatever you've bought, it can fail at any time. And so one of the best advice I always have for you is to have a backup, have another of something, so that way if it were to fail, you can just grab one out of the closet and plug it in and move on with your life. Uh, oh, I had another thing, the uh, MP60. No reason whatsoever. It's been on the tank for 10 years. <laughs> Decided to just drop to the bottom, and the motor was shifting, and the little tags I used to hold it in place were pulling loose. So I replaced all those tags, I put the pump where it belonged, and I grabbed my extra wet side and stuck it on the tank and turned it on, and there's flow in the tank. And the one that fell off is still in the bottom of my tank. <laughs> I'm not even ashamed. I mean, it's there. I'll have to pull it out. But um, the nice thing about having the extra wet side was that I could put that in there because it was clean and ready to go. And now I can deal with the one that came off and clean it up and get it ready for wherever it goes. Maybe I'll put it on the front and go through the rotation, get all, all of my wet sides cleaned this week. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it's just like one thing after another lately has just been falling apart and it's super annoying. And then if you have things falling apart in your house at the same time, it's yet another project you have to work on. And that just, it seems to just, I'm not gonna say overwhelm you, but super annoying. <laughs> so, you know, I would like to know what kind of things you've addressed or what kind of things you've let go. And uh, this doesn't have to be like, you know, I'm revealing this horrible thing that I did. I just meant little minor things, you know, nothing, nothing major. If it's major, don't tell us. <laughs> just be glad you fixed it and your livestock is okay. Now, if you can buy whatever you need to replace what's on your tank locally, it's always good to support the local economy. If you're not able to or the fish stores are just too far away, Amazon is really, you know, the most convenient choice people have. But of course, there's the big vendors uh, like Premium Aquatics, Marine Depot, BRS, uh, Champion Lighting is still around. Um, and there's probably a few more. And then there's me. <laughs> so there may be something that I sell that you need. Speaking of which, I mentioned this guy here to you guys a few weeks ago, the Aqu Auto Aqua Smart Stir. And this is what it looks like. And I shared it on Instagram and I shared it on um, Facebook. And so this fits the Red Sea vial. And you know, it would fit something smaller, but it won't fit the Salaford beaker because that's square. Um, so you got this little guy here. It plugs in with USB wire. I think it takes, I don't know, a couple hours to charge, and then it's good for a super long time. 
and you'll see the light on it when it charges and the light changes color inside the body when it's full. And then when it gets low, it's supposed to like flash red to let you know I haven't got to that point. But when you turn it on, you hear nothing. It's near my microphone right now. And I feel the vibration in my hand, but there's no sound. It's dead, dead silent. This is the little itty bitty tiny bead that it comes with. It is so small. And this guy will go in your beaker and then this will spin it. <laughs> you can see it maybe spinning. Let me see if I can get the light to... I'm trying to block out the worst offender of the light. Well, the bead is spinning. There you go. And the point is, it's dead silent. It's so cool. And I uh, did an alkalinity test on my Instagram. And, uh, you know, I count in the drops and then it changes color. And I did my test in about 30 seconds flat with this thing. This is a $30 device. It's the best stocking stuffer. I've got them in stock. If you want to uh, make a purchase, just know that the shipping will end up being $6, not whatever my website computes. And, the you know, I will refund you the difference. So, like yesterday, someone bought one. And uh, they went out and they get $9 back. <laughs> I'm not trying to take advantage of people. My website just computes FedEx. So if I can ship post office, it saves you guys money. You get to enjoy your products and not spend a lot of money on shipping. And, you know, I'd like to do it that way because I think it's smart. And I've been using a magnetic stirrer now for, I don't know, whenever I did that video, about four years ago maybe. And someone 3D printed that and made it and sent it to me from China as a gift. And uh, I've been using it ever since. I hate to hold a vial and shake it. And for 30 bucks, I mean, you literally cannot beat this thing. It's fantastic. And then if for some reason, like let's say it's mixing in a Red Sea vial, but you use Elo's test kit like I do, and you want to, and you know, the Elo's would fit in there, by the way. I totally could do that because that bead is so small. I could probably use that vial. But the Red Sea is the exact right diameter. But if you're trying to measure the color looking down through the fluid onto a color chart, you can pour out the Red Sea liquid that's been mixed into your ELOS vial and put it on your card and go ahead and get your measurement. So you are not going to be hamstrung with this device. It sure makes it easy to add the drops and count the scoops and the things that we do without having to shake. And uh, I just can't imagine people not wanting this. <laughs> it's so great. I'll, I'll probably sell them all out way before I expect it to and I'll just get more in. But uh, they really are nice, and I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Um, I think it comes with a one-year warranty. This is distributed through Coral View. They're a huge company, so you don't have to worry about not being taken care of if something comes up. So that is something that I want you guys to know about because I, I really was impressed. You know, I got it. I saw it a year and a half ago at Macna when they were showing the prototype. I said, yeah, that thing's really cool, and it finally came to market. Uh, another thing that's coming to Milo's Reef very soon is the newer version of the Kamor X1 pump, which is the Wi-Fi version. And so I've got some of those coming in. So if you like the original one or you like the Wi-Fi version, I'm gonna have both in stock. So you can you know just find something you like and buy it. And then the uh, biggest news that won't affect you guys directly. I mean, you know, you're on YouTube, you're watching videos, but if you're shopping a Milo's Reef, the newer version is so close to coming out and I'm sure there'll be some hiccups initially, and we'll be trying to, you know, squash bugs as quickly as we can. But uh, that newer version of the website should be really nice and hopefully a much better shopping experience because we're putting in some new shipping uh, rules that should help compute things better. And uh, we're going to have, you know, as you're adding things to your cart, it shows on the side. I mean, it's some really nice features and a lot of little thumbnail pictures that pop up. It's pretty cool. And Critter ID is going to get really, really robust compared to what it's always been. Sometimes I get an email from people about Critter ID and they say, you know, how much is that Zoanthid? <laughs> I said, did you see it on Critter ID? That's just me telling you what it's called. I don't sell livestock. So uh, I think some people get confused with that. And maybe even now they'll get even more confused because now it looks like I'm giving you all the information. But it's so that way you know how to care for it, what it needs, um, what it's not compatible with. There's a, there's a monster list of data that has to be entered to fill in everything, but hopefully it'll uh, fill in nicely over the next, you know, in the coming weeks and be something that you guys really uh, enjoy. And the nice thing is you'll get to interact with it. You could actually, um, well, I'll talk about it later, but there's parts where you guys can get involved if you like. So that's kind of nice. All right, let me scroll up and look at some of your pictures. My, uh, my, oh, and I have a story. You know, you guys love stories. So we're gonna do story time with me left today um, because this is a true thing that happened 
way back in the uh, late 2000s where I've been telling you guys for the longest time, and I had a customer here yesterday picking up his order, and he was telling me how when he mixes his salt water, he just uses it, and he doesn't test it. And I said, it's so important that you test what you've made. And he said, well, you know, I really should, I know. <laughs> so I told him my story. And when I was done talking to him, he says, okay, I'm going to start testing my water from now on. And I thought, that's good, because I'm not trying to trick you into using your test kit. <laughs> I'm trying to protect your livestock. Because as Caitlin says, water tests save lives. So we want to make sure that we are saving lives and keeping everyone healthy. So here's the story. Um, 12, 13 years ago, whatever it was, I was mixing salt water this time of year, maybe December, maybe January. And I had at the time the American Pinpoint pH Pro. So that's a thing that you hold in your hand that kind of, I don't know what to compare it to, kind of thicker than a cell phone that has a probe on a wire. And you can just hold the device, turn it on, put the probe in any salt water you have, and it'll instantly tell you the pH. And I love the convenience of that because I could use it anywhere. I could use it in brand new salt water, I could use it in my reef tank, I could use it in my quarantine tank, I could use it in uh, my angle tank. I, I could just take it everywhere and just put it in the water and measure. And I could leave it on and leave the probe in, and, it would, and I just glanced over at it and it told me the pH. And a lot of you don't own the Apex controller. So having some way to just know pH at a glance is really, really practical. And that device is a little bit better than a pH pen. Because a pH pen, you've got to grab the pen from wherever it is stored, you've got to turn it on, put it in the water, look at it, and then rinse it and put it away. This probe, you're going to put it wherever you like and turn the machine on and leave it on or flip the switch on and off, but it's always in place where it belongs. And then, like I said, if you're doing a water change, you can take the probe and move it elsewhere. So, for example, if you have a reef and the, and the uh, pH of your tank is 8.25, and then you have a brand new barrel of salt water next to you, you, in theory, could take the pH probe out of your sump that's connected to your apex. <laughs> like that works. Like that even works. Um, you take the pH probe out of the tank and you put it in the barrel, and then you have to wait for the apex to notice it. And that could take... 30 seconds to 60 seconds and then you find out your number and you put it back in your tank but now it's affected your graph on the apex you know that shows your normal reef parameters and i personally don't like that i want to have a probe that's for my test that doesn't affect my normal graphs so i don't see some weird spike or drop in the uh, normal frequency of my numbers that's just me so if you own the american pinpoint meter which is probably like 80 bucks then you can take this probe and you can put it wherever you need to do and you can measure the tank you can measure the barrel and you're using the same device to measure both, and you can verify that the numbers are accurate. So what happened about 13 years ago is I'd mixed up a big barrel of salt water, probably 33 gallons, 40 gallons, something like that. And, you know, it'd been circulating, had a huge mag pump in the bottom, and I dropped in a glass thermometer, and I looked at the temperature, and then I took out my ref refractometer, and I looked at salinity, and then I put in my pH probe in there, and it was something low, like 7.6 or 7.5 or 7.4. And I thought, wow, that's really low, but... It's winter, the house is you know, sealed tight, CO2 is probably up, so I'll just you know, go to the reef chemistry calculator, I'll type in my number, I'll find out how much soda ash I need to add to it, I put it in, pH was 8.25, it matched my reef, I did my big water change, and I didn't think twice about it. That was it. Um, I don't know, a few weeks later, a month later, you know, I did the same thing. And I got a phone call from a fish store owner in Arkansas, and he was, uh, he was very uh, intense on this phone call. And he said, Mark, do you use Kent Sea Salt? And I said, yeah. And he says, I need you to test your water right now. I was like, well, I tested a few days ago. He goes, no, I need you to mix up some water, and I need you to test it right now for alkalinity. I was like, okay. I mean, that wasn't like the simplest, most convenient thing to ask me to do. But I said, okay, I'll mix up a gallon, or I'll mix up five gallons. I'm not going to make a barrel because I don't need it. He says, that's fine. Call me back in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I mix up this barrel, or, you know, this bucket with some salt water and uh, I put in my, uh, I take my test kits out and I measure and everything measured right except alkalinity was 1.0 instead of eight or nine or 10. It was 1.0. So I called him back. And I said, well, my alkalinity is 1.0. How weird is that? And he said, I knew it. He was so mad. So he had a huge 800 gallon reef in his fish store. That was his, you know, his show tank. It, it, it was, this beautiful reef, and it was going downhill. 
and he didn't know why, so he thought, well, let me change a bunch of water, and because that always resets everything. And the more he changed the water in the tank, the more the tank, the reef was dying. He was very, very frustrated, and he then said to himself, well, what is the advice I always tell my customers? I need to listen to that, and my advice always to them is to test everything. So he tested his tank, and then he tested his new water, and that's when he discovered it had like zero alkalinity, or one. And he was like, oh my god, the salt mix is defective. And that's why he called me to verify because I was in a different state, you know. And then, you know, so he was really, really upset with, you know, the pro the manufacturer. And he did a big thread about it on Reef Central. And he told the entire world, you know, the salt is bad, the salt is bad. And everyone tested their salt and everyone realized that it had no alkalinity. So, and at the same time, a lot of people complained their tanks were not doing well. So he basically was the person that lit the flame <laughs> to this storm, where in my case, there was no problem at all because I tested the water and I corrected as needed, so my reef never knew. And that is why it's so important you test your water, because I was using soda ash and buffering up my pH, which was actually bringing up my alkalinity. And so when I used it in my reef, my reef didn't know the difference because it was perfect. So if you are just buying salt water from the fish store because you don't like to make your own, or you're buying uh, RO water from the fish store, or if you're buying boxes of salt water from Petco, or if you're buying, you know, powdered salt and mixing your own, whatever you're using, you're not immune to something going wrong. So it really is important when you come home with whatever you've purchased, that you take it and you put it, you know, you get it set up in a way where you can access the water, pour it into a small container, start doing your water test and verify. And if you bought like five jugs of water, you only have to test one jug because they're all the same. In theory, if you watch, they filled up five jugs of say salt water. And you're going to go ahead and fix, you know, do the measurements on the first one. You'll know the other four are good. And if everything's good on the first jug, you can do your water change. If anything's wrong, you need to make the correction. It'll be a little bit harder to make the correction in individual jugs. In that case, I would pour it into a larger trash can, just like you do in the fish store, and mix it up properly in there with whatever's lacking, and then perform your water change. But if you are just trusting that everything is fine, or if you've been buying the water for a long time and you're not really sure what's going on with your tank because it's just not doing well, but it, it seems okay, maybe that's the problem because you're not verifying things. And the verification is so important because the livestock is relying on you to stay alive. So please do test your new salt water. If you bought a barrel of salt or a bucket of salt or a box of bags of salt, Take out the first bag, mix up your batch, measure everything, and then anything else in that box or that bucket or that barrel should be the same. You, It's not like stratification is really going to hit you. I mean, it's possible, but it's kind of unlikely. I buy these ginormous barrels of salt that make a 1,000 gallons of salt water, and they're 500 pounds. <laughs> I cannot mix it. There's no way. I do some rolling to get it into the house, and then it sits stationary in my garage for until it's empty. And I just scoop from the top and work my way down until it's empty. So, you know, there's possible possibility there's more alkalinity at the top than there is at the bottom. I'm not putting some kind of mixing tool in there and trying to pout, uh, mix up my powders. Jack is trying to see which of the balls in the tree are edible. Get out of there. Get out of there. Get out of there. It's not for you. But they're round. <laughs> Um, so uh, what what Kent ended up doing in that situation was they went ahead and they replaced all the bad salt. So in that case, you had to send in a, one pound of the salt that was bad to prove that it was bad. And if you know they verified it, they went ahead and they replaced your bucket. And I, ended up getting, I got six buckets of new salt. And that was that. Um, all right. So the story's been told. Now let's go to your questions. I like the way Berkey thinks. He says I'm awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, I figured a lot of people were getting their trees up early this year because, you know, we're kind of ready to get into 2021 and put 2020 behind us. So let's just jump on it and move forward. The uh, peppermint angelfish that's in this tree is one of two. There are only two of these on the planet. And uh, that was made by Jason Langer, the cookie guy that I told you guys about, the fish cookie guy on Instagram. 
And he makes these beautiful cookies of all these different fish, and he decorates them. They're gorgeous, and he gifts them to certain people. And I told him, I really love the cookie, but I want something I put on my tree every year. I want it to last forever. So he made the backing out of something, and then he actually did the icing bag, but he put something else in there to actually make the decorations, and it was super difficult. And he made one for me, and he made one for himself, and he said he'll never do it again. So that little guy gets put in a very soft paper towel inside one of those zip, Ziploc uh, plastic bins like you get lunch meat in, and I keep it isolated from touching anything else in my box of ornaments so it won't get ruined. And uh, so it gets a prime spot on the tree because I love the peppermint angelfish. And uh, it's a lot cheaper than the $25,000 living one that comes from the ocean. <laughs> Let's see, I'm going to look for some questions here. Caleb, thank you for making it live to one of our streams and that you've been enjoying all the episodes. That's great. Uh, Sam is giving us a little information. I don't know. I haven't heard anything about this. He says, tell everyone who has the newest J-Bow pumps they have to buy the AQ Link A1 and not the older J-Bow adapter for the Apex controlling. Don't make his mistake. So you guys have been warned. Got to get the right part. Ah, oh, see, one else said he had so many issues going on in his tank, he decided to give up his tank, his Reefer 250. Uh, that's a shame, but you know, sometimes you just need a break. And that was actually one of the other topics I was thinking about doing a live stream about, is like, when is it time to stop? <laughs> I mean, here you're talking to a guy that never stops, but people do it, and sometimes by stopping, by shutting it down, and just taking a break, storing the equipment, you know, returning the livestock to the fish store, or selling it to someone else, you can kind of get a break from all the stress of trying to fight your tank, and then maybe maybe in six months, a year, a year and a half from now, you might think, you know, I'm kind of in the mood. I think I want to go back to running a saltwater tank again. And you might plumb it differently. You might wire it differently. You might replace certain parts that you just never really liked in the first place. And you may have a better success on your second attempt. Sometimes you really have to actually reset the tank to get things back on track. And it's not just something as easy as replacing a power head or scooping out the sand or, you know, or something along those lines. Sometimes it's just such a mess, you just have to start from scratch. Hello, Mermaid's Reef. I like your uh, avatar. Oh, thanks, Andrea, for putting the link uh, to the smart store. Okay, Jose says, can you give us an update on your skunk clownfish? It's been a while. How many do you have left? Do you still have the same anemone they were hosting? Yes, there is one sea bay anemone. There are 11 skunks. I try to count them. Uh, usually I get up to about 10, but I'm almost 100% sure there are 11 in there still. The anemone cube seems to have about 12 clowns. Um, and we added some new fish to that tank recently, the little uh, Bengais and the uh, Randall Gobies. So they are looking healthy and happy. And the three Fridmani firefish that we added, or dartfish, that were put in the 400 gallon, they keep coming out of the corner that's behind this tree. Um, and they're super timid, but they're coming out, and they come out in their groups of three, and then they go back into their hidey hole when some whale swims by, like Spock or Crown Royal. But they, I'm trying to make sure they're getting food every single day. And uh, it's, it's going well. Oh, let me talk about another food that I'm probably going to start selling in my shop because, you know, I like Ben Arif a lot, and uh, I, I use Rod's food for my frozen. But there's a product from Elos that came out more than a year ago, probably two years ago, where they have these little canned foods. It looks like little cans of cat food, but they're small. And they have three different flavors. One is worms, one is shrimps, and one is cyclops. And so for these little tiny uh, Fridmanis, I'm sorry, I keep saying Fridmanis, Hell Freaky Firefish, for those as well as the new fish in the 60 gallon anemone cube we want to kind of target feed some of these guys and make sure some food got in their belly 
because all the uh, regulars of the tank, the guys that have always lived there, they know to go after the food voraciously, and so the newcomers are too shy. So we opened up a couple of the cans, and they have a little plastic lid that when you're done, you can seal it and you can put it back in the fridge. The nice thing is it's fresh. And in theory, you're supposed to use the can up in about a week, but you can have nice fresh food. You don't have to wait for it to thaw. You just keep it in the fridge, pop the lid off, take a little bit out, put it in the tank, it goes everywhere, and you can feed your babies. And uh, so we tried the Cyclops first because it's very small, and we thought that'd be good for the gobies, and the gobies basically saw it going everywhere and ignored it. So then we went to the shrimp, which seems to be some kind of mycid shrimps, and we put those in, and that was a hit, and they love it. So it's nice to have another choice in your arsenal of foods, and I already sell Elo's test kits, so it makes sense for me to go ahead and pick up some of their foods, and those will be available eh, probably by the beginning of next year. And so if you're interested in getting something new to add to your choices and you want to do something fun or you, you want your kids to help feed the tank, it's something that you could do together because it's not like metering out the flake food or deciding how many pellets. Now you can actually you know, hand them a fork of it and say, here, put that in the tank, and your kid can do it. And that would be nice and fun. And uh, according to uh, one person at Elos, they actually took one of their cans and they opened it and they kept it in the fridge for about three weeks and then, you know, verified and it still was in great shape. So it may last longer, but I wouldn't keep, you know, I would not try to stretch it out. Just spoil your tank, <laughs> use the can up, you know, if you have multiple tanks, that's even better. And you can kind of just do your thing. You can use it in your quarantine tank for your new fish. And then, uh, you know, if it's a little, if it gets too old, just toss it. You know, don't, don't take a chance and, you know, pollute your tank with some bad stuff. Mirza, hello. She is reaching out from Sweden. Watching from Sweden, that's awesome. Dennis, did you happen to see that I posted your picture here on YouTube on the community tab? I liked the one picture of your tank where you had that giant level. And so I posted that up yesterday and gave you photo credit because I said when you're measuring a big tank, don't put a little tiny level in the middle because it's going to do you a disservice. You need a huge level like you've used. And I was really impressed that you did that. And so I, took your picture from Club Miller's Reef and I put it uh, on here on YouTube for others to see. He said um, that he has every critical piece of equipment doubled in his tank or in, as a reserve on the shelf. And that's really the best case. You know, having two skimmers and two return pumps and two, you know, controllers, that can add up really quickly. But when you need something, it sure is nice to have it. And I tend to have so much extra stuff in my back room, I can usually make something work uh, when something fails. Uh, Caleb, thank you very much for the super chat. He said, I have a black limpet snail, which he calls an amazing creature, and he uh, keeps getting stuck in the filtration equipment as he's obsessed with the source of flow. Any ideas? Well, I mean, it's a snail. It's going to go where it likes to go. You can keep moving it somewhere else. It just depends on how small the tank is. You know, obviously, the bigger the tank, the further you can put it from wherever it's going on a regular basis. And maybe you can distract it with a really nice rock full of algae or something. Uh, you may end up finding that it will make babies, and those babies may end up in your sump, in your pumps. You know, I mean, they can get everywhere. But uh, I really do like them. And uh, keep them out of your equipment may be something you have to kind of keep an eye on. Or maybe it just gets there and enjoys its meal, and you get to enjoy the show. Uh, Battle OCR says, I'd love to test my water before I use it, but man, that's so many tests. No way to, it's practical for me. Yes, but then when something goes wrong and you find out later why the numbers are bad, then will it still be practical <laughs> or not? You know, I mean, I, I do things differently than a lot of people, though. So maybe to me it seems like no big deal because I mix up a container that holds 265 gallons of salt water. And so when I take my water, you know, after it's been running for a day, I take a, a small bucket, holds like, I don't know, I, the bucket's like two gallons, and I fill it up, you know, an inch. So I've got some nice clean water that came out of my big vat, and I measure that for everything. And then I know everything in that barrel is that. But then I do know over time the alkalinity will drop on that because it just does. And so when it's time for a water change, I again take my two-gallon buck, two bucket, put it on the output, drain out like an inch of water, throw that away, grab another inch of water, tested for alkalinity, and usually it's around six. 
and then I'll buffer it back up to 8.5 or 9 or 9.5, wherever my tank happens to be at the time. And the uh, I can do my water change, and that reef doesn't know any, any different. So I only had to do that one test. But testing everything, the first, <clears throat> the first time you open up your bag of salt or your jug, you know, it would be really, really smart. And that shouldn't be too expensive to you. Um, test kits usually are good for a full year. That gives you about 50 tests. And if you're using, you know, if you're doing water changes once a month, uh, then, you know, you're talking about doing, well, if you're making a new batch with brand new salt every single time, yeah, you're going to do it, you know, 12 times. But if you're using a batch of salt that lasts you multiple months, you just have to test the first time you've mixed. And then every other batch you make after that will match the first time because there's no surprises. Alkalinity doesn't change in the salt mix while it's dry. I'm only talking about after it's been mixing and sitting in circulation under a sealed lid, the alkalinity will drop and you will end up finding that the number will drop over time. It could be a few days, it could be a few weeks, it could be a few months, but the alkalinity will drop in there. It just does. It's just a weird thing and it's good that we know it so we can just correct it before we do our water change. Kevin, thank you so much for putting in your order. I appreciate that. It will go out Monday. Louis says, how do you like your Nyo skimmer? I love it. And no, it's it's been pretty much foolproof. I've uh, been running it now since whenever I did, you know, when I, I can't even remember. I feel like I've had it about four years. And I have a second one on my smaller tank just because I like it that much. They're dead silent. They're easy to clean. You can completely take them apart. The only problem that I've run into specifically is trying to get a replacement pump. And I just, I feel like that should be easier to do. I don't need one, but when I do, I'm going to want it. And so I placed an order for a replacement pump months ago and never got it. So I contacted Ecotech and said, you know, I still need this pump. And they're like, oh yeah, no problem. And then they said, okay, we're sending you two pumps. I'm like, perfect, I'll pay. <laughs> and then when I got my box, it even said on the paperwork, two pumps. And I opened the box and there's one pump body, no impeller, no cover. It's just a block with a cord. I'm like, what is this to do with this? That's not what I asked for. So I told him I'm still looking for the replacement pump. I want to literally have a whole pump I can put in the skimmer and take the bad one out if and when it dies. So that has been the only downside. But I've been running the skimmer for four or five years. A lot of people don't even keep the same skimmer that long. My first skimmer I had um, on the 280 gallon reef, I ran that thing about 14 years. I still own it, it's still in the back room, but I really like my knives. I answered that already. Uh, Scott says, I'm using the blue red sea salt bucket and using an auto water change to get my salinity where I want it, but it's increasing my alkalinity too much. Should I change salts to a lower alkalinity salt bucket? Well, what is the alkalinity of your tank and what is the alkalinity of your new salt? And uh, you give me those two numbers and then we can talk. Mario is here from Panama. Hello. Uh, Jay's Reef says, is there any telltale signs of when to replace the tubing on a, on a BRS doser? The couple on hand just, I have a couple on hand, just not sure if it's a time thing or something else to determine replacement. Usually you can feel the tubing if it feels like it's turning to stone, that's a pretty good indication. Or if you're trying to calibrate and you can't. Those are two ways of knowing. Uh, some people just like to replace them, on a, like you said, on a timely basis, which could be every six months or it could be once a year. I bought uh, extra ones to put on the Versa pumps, and I did replace mine once, and uh, it's just feeding my calcium reactor. And as a matter of fact, now that you've mentioned that, I'm going to go ahead and recalibrate to make sure I'm still getting the right amount through my calcium reactor. So I'm glad you mentioned that. But um, the other w reason you would change it is if it just fails, it cracks and lets air in and no longer doses, then you definitely have to replace the tubing. But you're talking about you know being uh, in maintenance mode, and so I would do a squeeze test or even, you know, there's a trick you do with a fan belt in a car. When you lift the hood and you want to check if a fan belt's still good, you can take it with your fingertips and you can twist. You know, you're not trying to pull it off. You're just trying to twist and see how it feels. It's kind of the same principle with the you know, dosing pump tubing. You can do a kind of a turn. You can pinch it with your fingers and see if it feels soft and pliable or if it's becoming too rigid. If it's getting too rigid, I'll replace it. Um, Dennis says, yesterday I bought the Nasso Elegance Tang, 
He's a little bit skinny, so what would you recommend for feeding? Currently giving him krill, mysis, and artemia with fauna, myrn, garlic concentrate. Uh, I don't think you're going to need the garlic necessarily. I mean, it's an appetite stimulant. Nothing wrong with that. But I would say load up on nori. So if you're already putting sheets of nori in the tank or you're clipping it to the glass, the NASA likes that. And then, of course, as a treat, this is not going to fatten up your tank, but for as a treat, you can give her some banana or him. You might have a boy. Um, Caitlin was feeding banana to Spock yesterday, and Spock loved it, got a stomach full. But um, na uh, they love nori, and they will eat it until they're full. So you can put in a, a half a sheet of nori every single day. I know you have a huge tank, so you probably need to put in one or two sheets to feed all your fish, but make sure that NASA is getting some. And if you're worried that the NASA is too new and too timid and a little nervous around all the active fish because it's just not part of the gang yet, you can take the nori in the tank and you can just rub your fingers back and forth and you'll break up the nori into like little green flakes blowing around and the NASA will just swim up and gobble those up as they blow by instead of having to go fight the crowd trying to get at the clip. But eventually it will come to the nori and it will join on the feeding clip just like you know mine does. But that's how I would recommend. And you'll see it get thicker and thicker the more you feed. Uh, Aftershock says, my skimmer does not produce as many internal bubbles as it used to. I've taken it apart and cleaned it multiple times, but the increase is minimal. My phosphate is 0 0.03, which is good. My nitrate is 2. No, both those numbers are fine. They have nothing to do with the protein skimmer. Um, it could be a lack of food in the tank. You know, you're just, you're not giving very much, so there's nothing for the skimmer to pull out. But the protein skimmer has, I mean, it's a, an acrylic body with a pump and an airline tube that goes up. And those are the areas that you check. So you've got water going into the skimmer, but you're not seeing the foam. So I would look at where the rubber tubing comes down to the nipple. I would pull that tubing off the nipple and I would inspect that little tiny port that you jam the tubing on and I would look and see if it's obstructed. And if it's not obstructed, if it's crystal clear, I'm gonna take a flashlight, look at it from the top, look at it through the side, you know, really, really inspect it. And, you know, just make sure there's no salt in there because there's a good chance there's some salt buildup and it got really, really narrow and less air can pass through. The other thing could be is if your skimmer has a silencer that inadvertently you turn the silencer down, you actually closed off the air some and you did wide, open wide up. I never run air, I never limit the air going to a protein skimmer. I have the valve completely open on that so we can draw in all the air it can. I see no reason to limit the air in a protein skimmer. And then finally, you wanna check the impeller of the skimmer and make sure that it's running well. Now, you may not have done this in the past, but you could do it today if you own a kilowatt, you plug your protein skimmer pump into the kilowatt, you see how many watts it's pulling, and then when you're looking at your skimmer and it's not running right, you can plug it into the kilowatt again, and if normally it pulls 75 watts and today it's pulling 13, you know there's a pump problem. So I would look at that. But uh, I, I'm almost certain what you have a salt creep clogging up the nozzle going into the pump that sucks in the water and chops it up to send the body to the skimmer. That's my guess. Odile says, when did you get a dog? Jack came into my life oh, three and a half months ago. Hey, Steve, sorry about that. Uh, I, it's not something I can predict. <laughs> I'm looking for the next question. Uh, Derby City says, I'm considering buying three Gen 3s, the XR30s, for my 125-gallon reef. Any tips on buying used equipment as far as what to look for? Well, you want to look and see if it's clean. You want to see if it's uh, got any visible salt damage. And even if you don't see it, if you were to open it up, you could then see if any of the salt got in and corroded the electronics inside. Gen 3 is pretty old. Um... I mean, I guess if the price is right <laughs> and it, it works when you get, you know, like let's say you buy it from someone, they're taking off their tank, they look great. 
and they've had no problems, you may have no problem with it as well. But that's an older light. I don't even know what year the Gen 3 came out. I feel like that was 2016, maybe even older. So um, that would be the one thing I'd be looking at specifically. And other than that, you know, I mean, if everything looks good, then yeah, you can proceed. But it's an older light, so it may not last as long as you're hoping. Mr. DKH says he's been having problems with green hair algae. So my answer is, how much cleanup crew do you have? Because that is a very important part that a lot of people forget about. Andrew, thank you very much for the super chat. He is uh, tuning in from, the, from South Wales. And uh, so he just snapped apart the silencer greatly. Not sure I understood that last part. But I, I'm glad you enjoy the channel. Aaron says, how tight of a temperature swing would you aim to keep your tank at? Uh, I tend to keep my tank around two degree swings per day. Uh, one and a half degrees to two degrees, that seems to work out pretty well for the aquarium. And it's been going on like this for so long that my livestock doesn't even know better. I know some people can really tighten it down and they can add enough heat and add enough cooling to where it's like a half a degree all the time. But my tank just warms up in the daytime and cools off at night. But I do have heaters to come on at night to make sure that it doesn't get too cold. Um, Macy's daddy says, what do you think about posting dead fish on social media? I feel for the people that have a lot, had the losses, but I think it feels the detractors of our hobby. Yeah, it's a legitimate question because there are people out there that are trying to stop the aquarium trade entirely. They don't want people to have aquariums. They don't want people to have fish. And, uh, they want to make sure that, you know, anything they can find that they can use as evidence, you know, like as in pet neglect could be used uh, somehow in a court of law. It, it's, it is something to be concerned about. Usually the pictures that you see in most of those uh, uh, campaigns against the hobby, they'll have a, a piece of land that's just dirt, and you'll see like 50 or 500 yellow tangs all dead. And they're like, look at this. And it's the same picture that's been circulating for like 15 years. And it's the same one they always use to get people to say, oh my god, that's so terrible. It's not that they keep killing 500 tangs at a time and laying them on the dirt and taking another picture. It's the same darn picture every time. But as a hobbyist, I think sharing pictures of death doesn't necessarily help others. I mean, we're upset at the time. Some people are hoping that by showing the picture that someone else could say, oh, this is what happened. But that's really hard to uh, diagnose through a photograph of an animal that's no longer alive. Uh, it's going to be guesswork at best. It's not accurate. So... You know, I mean, I can't tell people not to post it. And I have shared two or three pictures in my hobby of fish that had died mysteriously. But for the most part, yeah, I don't want to help the people fighting us by giving them more ammunition against us. So it's a valid question. Hey, Maria. It says, it's Gina. <laughs> Hi, Gina. How are you? <laughs> Um, Alex says, have you ever been to the Dominican Republic? I went there and got stung by jellyfish. I have been stung by jellyfish in quite a few different oceans, and uh, it, it's never fun. And there was this one dive I was on with some friends, and when we were moving through the water, we had to at one point get to this one spot as a group and wait near the surface, and then the boat would come over and we would all get back into the boat. And as we were waiting in this cluster... I saw these pink jellyfish just surrounding us, almost 360 degrees. It was just a little bit less. And I uh, started swimming away from them, and they said, where are you going? And I said, away from the jellyfish. And I swam through the opening where there was no jellies, even though there was tons of them around whatever that is, 300 degrees worth. And as I was swimming through the area that had no jellies, I could feel the stings all over my face. So the, what happens is sometimes the people that are driving uh, their boats, their, their uh, propeller chops up the jellies, and then divers get stung by the little bits you don't even see in the water. It just You get hit with little tiny shrapnel that just stings, and it was actually jellyfish, even though you didn't actually have a full-on jelly get you. But I've had some friends get really stung where it's stuck in their neck and they're peeling it off. Ugh, it's the worst. So, um, you know, it can happen. 
I remember when I was diving uh, during my trip to Dubai, oh, not diving, snorkeling, during my trip to Dubai, there was an area where I was swimming around this really cool rock outcropping, and the uh, I was getting stung, and I was like, I don't even see the jellies, but they were in the water, so it happens. But no, I've not been to Dominican Republic, I don't think. Maybe I have. <laughs> DR. I think I was just adjacent to that, honestly. Uh, Odell says, do you carry a pH probe? I uh, sell the pH probes for the Apex. I have just the probe itself. Uh, those are in stock. I don't sell the American Pinpoint. That you can get from anyone. Except me. <laughs> Aftershock says, do I need to cover my ATO reservoir that's under the tank, inside the stand? Yes. Uh, if you just leave that container open, it's full of RODI water. It's just a magnet for dirt, and it's going to attract anything it can, and your zero TDS water will actually not be zero at all, and the number will be quite high, and it'll get higher and higher the longer it's open. So it's best to have a lid on top that keeps it closed with just a small hole for the tubing that comes out that feeds water into your sump. Uh, Gary says, I think I have a big outbreak of vermited snails, a bunch of tiny white donut shaped all over the rocks. Are those the snails? Should I get rid of them? What you're looking at are not vermitids. They are um, spirorbid worms, and they make these little tiny white uh, circles, like you said, like little donuts. And if you were to magnify them, you'd see it's a really cool casing with a filter feed that comes out, and it eats with a little feather duster type of appendage. And on my Critter ID section, you can look under the pod section, and you'll see the spororbid worms. Or maybe it's in the worm section. And uh, that's a super-duper macro shot. I was actually impressed I got that shot. But you can actually see the beast, and they are no problem. And they scrape off really easily with a credit card, but they're not an infestation. They're just kind of a, a benthic filter feeder that will just do its thing, and you know it doesn't hurt your, your ecosystem. It's nothing to worry about. Uh, Bricky says, I sent you an email quite a while ago, been having issues with fish in my overflow boxes, but I have an older dual corner overflow planted aquarium. Would you, can you build the covers? Yes, I can build the covers. You can send me a fresh email. I need to see pictures of your overflow box to see the shape, and I really need those dimensions to make sure it's correct because there's a lot of different sized overflow boxes from Planet, and that way I can make you a nice lid that will fit on one or two, however many boxes you have. Just send it again, and uh, I'll get you taken care of. It's nice to hear from you, Gina, um, and uh, glad to hear all that. So I'm glad things are looking up for you. It's nice to see you on the stream. Hope your tank is doing well. Ryan tells me that today is Lucas's three-year-old birthday. Three years. Congratulations and happy birthday. <laughs> Maria, thank you. Yes, I had a very nice Thanksgiving. We did. And uh, we're looking forward to a really nice Christmas as well. The only downside is not seeing family members and having to just stay home with all this stupid COVID. Oh, Sal is using the Cyclops from Elos, and then he puts it on a plate and he freezes it and breaks it up. <laughs> well, that's the opposite of fresh food. But okay, fair enough. That's a good way to, if you're worried you're not going to use it up fast enough, you could freeze part of it. That makes sense. Good tip, Sal. I appreciate that. Uh, Aaron White says... How do you connect the Ecotech battery backup to your Apex? What cable do you use? 
The uh, Ecotech battery backup connects directly to the Ecotech gear. It doesn't connect to the Apex. If you want to have a battery backup for the Apex, you want a real computer UPS. And you can get the black wall ward, I think it's a 9 volt power supply, maybe 9, 12, something like that. And you'll plug that in to the battery backup and run that wire to the secondary port on your on the brain of your Apex. But the Ecotech battery backup is made for Ecotech gear only. Haley says, how many tanks can be in one tank together? It really depends on the size of the tank and the size of the tanks. Um, Glenn says, have you been making any changes with your smaller aquarium with the Nero pump? Will you be having changes with it over the Christmas holidays? Uh, the 60 gallon tank is, oh, now I see what you're saying. <laughs> My brain is like, what? Uh, it's just, <sighs> yes. Hopefully I'll have some time to deal with it. I've been dealing with some other things that are more important right now, so it's just kind of idling. Everything inside there is okay. But uh, you can hardly see through the, the, the wall of the acrylic because it needs to be polished. It's so bad. And it, it's just an embarrassment. <laughs> it's such a mess. Let's see. Aaron says, how do you know when you should start dosing? Uh, initially... It depends on what livestock you have and then how the water is holding up over time. So as your corals are absorbing the, the uh, elements from the water and you measure each week and you see the numbers depleting and you see that your saltwater water changes are not bringing them up and keeping them. In other words, if your alkaline stays the same and your calcium stays all the time because you run softies, for example, then you probably don't need to dose at all. But when you start delving into LPS corals you, and you start adding SPS corals and you're adding clams and, and uh, all these other things that need alkalinity, calcium, magnesium in greater degree, you'll discover that you need to dose. And so people initially, I always recommend please dose by hand as, at first. Learn how much your tank needs, pour it in yourself manually. And as, the, uh, the, uh, as you get a really good feel for how much your tank needs, then you can buy an electronic device like the Camor, and you can tell it to put in the exact amount you've been putting in by hand each day. So let's say for the last three months you've been putting in 10 milliliters a day and you say to yourself, I'm done, I'm not doing this anymore, I want to buy a little tiny pump that will do it. The uh, Camor is a $60 pump, you hook that up to a jug of alkalinity and you will tell it to put in 10 milliliters each day and it'll. you can say do it 5 milliliters at this time and 5 milliliters an hour later if you want. Or you just do 10 at once and be done. And then once a day, it just comes on and does that. And then you would get one for calcium, and you get one for magnesium, and then you may have some other thing you want to dose as well, and you end up acquiring a lot of dosing pumps. But uh, initially, you don't need it. And I, I really do encourage people to do things manually initially to understand what's going on with the tank rather than hitting the tank with a bunch of really cool equipment, and then you're constantly wondering what's going wrong and why isn't it working the way you expected and, and why is this so complicated because it really doesn't have to be complicated. The point of automation is to take the maintenance out of your hands that um, was getting tedious. But when you've never done it before in your life, it's not tedious yet. <laughs> so, I mean, we already feed our tank. The only thing I tell people to do right out of the gate is when they get their new tank is set it up with a top-off device to add water that replaces what's evaporated. And if you have that evaporation taken care of so the, the water level never changes in the aquarium, that's great. But the dosing, you can manually dose for a super long time before you spend money, which will end up being hundreds of dollars, with containers and dosing pumps and tubing and all the things you get for as many things you're trying to dose. But then you'll be able to automate these things, but then your job will be as the uh, person taking care of the tank is you have to make sure the doser is working right, that, it, that the solution hasn't run dry and that the tubing is where it belongs and that it's not clogged up and that it's calibrated. So you see you have a new thing to keep track of, but you're not having to put it in yourself manually every single day. Now you're checking your equipment once a week, so to speak, or you know, glancing at it once a day and verifying from time to time that all is well. Uh, aquarium engineer says, tank looks great. Well, thank you. And he says, do you ever worry about aerosols from Christmas trees, candles, cleaning supplies? My tank is so big, it probably isn't a factor. Um, don't really use any aerosols here in the house. Uh, we do light candles that smell pretty, 
and I haven't noticed any change in the tank from that whatsoever. Um, there's candles in different rooms. Uh, a lot of the cleaning supplies we use now are um, bio-friendly and uh, they're, they're less caustic. They're more environmentally safe, but I still am not putting chemicals on or in the tank itself. And the tree, I've had a tree every year for the last few years and it's never affected the reef whatsoever. There's a, you know, I just water it. <laughs> I water my tree daily. Matter of fact, the last couple of years I had an auto top off to replace the water in the bottom of the tree and I didn't do it this year. So I'm gonna regret that, but I just pour in a, a one gallon bucket of water into my, into a funnel that goes down a tube into the base of the tree each day. And that seems to be working so good, you know, pretty good so far. But uh, if you are like using hairsprays, if you are using um, something to kill odors, you know, like a like a oust or something like that, you definitely want don't do not want to do it near the tank. Uh, I would even recommend not doing it in the room where the tank is. If you're having to do something like that, like you're doing some deep cleaning, you're cleaning the carpets to get ready for company or something. You can turn off the protein skimmer temporarily while that stuff's happening, and then when the company leaves and takes all their stuff and things are going back to normal, a couple hours later everything's settled, you can just go ahead and turn your skimmer back on, and that way you're not accidentally sucking in whatever the fumes were from the cleaning into your tank. Uh, Lincoln Town says, any thoughts on the Via Aqua titanium heater and controller? I panicked bought one from Marine Depot after realizing my tank is 67 degrees. Um, well, number one, I hope your tank isn't that temperature anymore. And number two, is that really the true temperature? Or was the little thermometer a flaky one? Because sometimes we get bad readings from cheap thermometers. Especially little digital ones, they're super, super cheap. They're, they're like, they were giving them away with a bucket of salt. I mean, they just had no value at all. And a lot of times they misled people and freaked people out. So I would get yourself a $3 glass thermometer, just float it in the tank after five minutes, look at it and see what it is. If uh, your tank really is getting that low, you're definitely gonna have livestock problems and uh, you gotta get that corrected. We wanna be around 77 to 79 this time of year. And uh, yeah, I hope you got the heater that matches your size tank. I'm glad it came with a controller, that's excellent. You need three watts per gallon. So if you have a 100 gallon tank, you need 300 watts of heat. If uh, you have a 50 gallon you know, tank, you need 150 watts of heat. And you can, and you bought it, so you already own it. But if you needed 150 watts of heat, I would tell the person to get two 75 watt heaters. That way, if one of those heaters ended up sticking on for some weird reason, it wouldn't have the wattage to overheat the tank. So that's something to keep in mind. Ron says, do you think T5s are enough to keep anemones and fish instead of LEDs? Oh, absolutely. Before LEDs were out, people were running LED uh, T5 tanks only, and they were they were loving it. And you're dealing with livestock that would have no problem. The fish don't care. <laughs> they don't care what light you use. The anemones will be fine under T5s. The general rule is to have them about seven inches off the water or maybe slightly higher. And uh, you may need to put a mixture of different bulbs to get the color you like. And in the, the way I like to put them is put the blue bulb in front and then the white bulb behind it. And then if you have pink and fuchsia and all that other stuff, you know, depending how many bulbs your fixture can hold, the uh, I like to look through that band of blue so the tank doesn't look weird. Uh, I find that if you have the white and then the blue, it looks strange with the blue in front. You're looking through the blue to the white, and it's looking really nice. And most of the times when I did tanks back in the day with T5s or um, power compacts, I was using the 50-50 bulbs, which was one white, one blue. And I put blues and whites. So now we have a lot more color choices, so you can mix in all kinds of stuff, but... That's just a, a little tip that may come in useful as you're figuring out your arrangement to make the tank look pretty. Um, Reefing Wonder says, I've done everything I can with my Apex. It is not communicating correctly. The Apex logo is still green and it's supposed to be orange. I troubleshoot it, but for some reason I can't get it. Um, I would suggest you go to the Neptune group on Facebook or go to the forum on neptunesystems.com because they have a really great forum that will help you. It probably has an FAQ with all the stuff you should do where you can step-by-step -step uh, diagnose and solve it. I know a lot of times we just want to ask a question, have someone tell us the answer. I don't know what your scenario is exactly. Uh, one of the things I would say is maybe you're dealing with a Wi-Fi situation, and if that's the case, I would run Ethernet from the router straight to that apex and see if you can communicate with it. 
just to kind of rule out anything. And then once that works, then you can try doing over Wi-Fi instead, which I'm not a fan of. Mine is hardwired. But uh, there are groups of people out there willing to help you get it so it works correctly, so you'll be happy. Uh, Haley says, what size tank do you recommend for a Nassau tank? Big, um, at least six feet long, probably, probably a 240 or greater. These are relatively large tanks, and they get bigger over time. Uh, when I got mine, it came with a 280, and now it's in a 400, and uh, it would love to have even more space. And actually, there's a lot of coral and rock in my tank. It'd be nicer if I had less stuff in the tank so that the Nassau could have more room to swim. But uh, I've had her a long time. I got her with the tank. I didn't, like, go buy a fish to put in my tank. It was part of a setup I purchased. And so I've kept her ever since. And uh, she's been with me for 16 years. But they really do need big tanks. And, like, a 240 is 6 feet long by 2 feet wide. So it's a nice big circle. And uh, But bigger is better. So the larger you can afford, the better it would be for this fish. There are other tanks out there you might get instead that don't need as much swimming room. Like the uh, the coal tang is a good one. Um, yellow tangs aren't nearly as demanding when it comes to space. They can go with a smaller tank. Hippo tangs. Uh, Juan says, have you changed anything on your tank due to equipment failure recently? Great question. No. Um, no, I haven't changed anything. I've just kept things going that break. <laughs> so if something breaks on me, I will then get it going again with the parts it originally came with or with backup parts or with a replacement part. Um, that's about it. But no, I haven't had to like give up on NIOS and go with eShops or something like that for the skimmer as an example. Uh, everything's been working well. So I would just continue to uh, make what I own work and I, I like things to last forever. I hate buying things twice. <laughs> and the old and the problem is when you have a large tank or when you've been running a tank for a long time, I guess it doesn't matter on the size of it. If you've been running a tank for a long time, things are going to fail during that uh, period. And it seems like you'll hit this weird tipping point where it seems like everything is breaking all at the same time. You're like, God, it's the lights, it's the pump, it's the heater, it's the controller, it's the pH probe, it's the calcium reactor, it's the skimmer. And you're just like, when is it going to end? What is the deal? Why is everything breaking at the same time? And that can be really aggravating. So, I mean, that's when you just have to start tackling it, jump on it, solve what's wrong, and move on. Um, Rainier says, I'm building a 66-gallon display refugium. How would you do the plumbing? Greetings from Austria. Greetings. Um, well, you're going to set it up probably similar to how we would set up a display tank. Uh, is your refugium going to drain into a display tank, or is it going to drain into a common sump? So you have a, a display, and you have a refugium, and then you have one sump. That would be kind of what determines how you're going to plumb it, because we push water up into a tank that's above which is typically the display tank. And then it's going to drain water out of a drain through a drain line that usually mixes with air. And if you were draining that into a display tank next to it, you'd end up putting a lot of air bubbles into your display tank, ruining the view. So it'd be better to drain that down into a sump, if possible, where you can trap the bubbles one way or another with a baffles, a filter sock, uh, something along those lines, and then pump up just pure water into the display tank. And that way everything looks nice and clear. When you go to public aquariums, it's very rare that you see a tank full of bubbles. It's usually nice, clean water, and you can enjoy the livestock. So I would think it's going to be something along those lines you've got to figure out. <clears throat> um, Michael Baldwin says, would you recommend calibrating temperature probes in ice water? 32 degrees is how we calibrate ref refrigeration probes for your manufacturer's recommendation versus three or four probes and averaging. Um, you know, I don't know the answer to that one, but that is exactly what we did also in fast food. We always had to calibrate everything down to ice water, to 32 degrees, and then you know you could get it 
dialed in and you knew when you put that probe anywhere else, you knew the temperature. But I don't know that our temperature probes can be done that way. I think that might be too far outside of their range. It might be easier, I don't know. <laughs> it's one of these probes I don't even think about. It just, I run it forever until it just doesn't work. Um, but I realize some people do like to calibrate. One of the things that I would do is I'd look at my apex says my temperature is right now in the tank based on the temperature probe. And then I put a glass thermometer in the tank. And, and I know that's a cheap $3 thermometer, but I'm just saying you can take that and you can compare it and see how close it is to the apex. And if, and you can also feel it by the touch. You know, there's, I don't know if you could do this, but I can put my fingers inside a tank and it feels too warm, I know instantly. And uh, so I can feel the water. If it feels like 81 and the thermometer says 77, I know something's not right. And then yes, you could calibrate and make adjustments or uh, set some kind of a, what do they call it? It's a correction in the software to add a couple of degrees to whatever the temperature probe is reading. Or you can just replace the probe with a new one, which I have those in stock. Uh, Aaron says, do you have any tips on getting your tank to be stable and not have the levels going up and down? Really, that is all about maturity. And that was the live stream we did a couple months ago, about, or maybe a little bit longer, about tank maturity. And really, it's about hobbyist maturity. So when your tank has been with you for about nine months, you've really seen everything go right or wrong. You've made the corrections. You've handled stuff. You've added new things to make things a little more automated and streamlined. And you will then discover after basically nine months or so, that things are now nice and level. And if they're not, if you're constantly chasing some kind of problem and it's been two years and you're still dealing with this weird roller coaster effect, then I would say that your approach as a hobbyist is not uh, consistent enough. It's too sporadic. You're like jumping on this problem, you're jumping on this problem, you're throwing all these things at the tank at once and you can't really isolate which of those things solved problem X. And so you end up with you're, you're guessing, so you just try everything, and then something works, but you didn't know which of the five things you did did it, but you're glad, but now something else goes wrong because of the extra things you did. If anything, I tell people to remove all the extra stuff and simplify their tank down to its essence, and then start plugging things back in to increase the uh, equipment arsenal that's under your tank. But if you have a whole bunch of gear going and you cannot control the tank, you probably have too much gear going on. And so I would say turn off the UV and turn off the CO2 scrubber and turn off this and you know just get down to water changes, um, stable temperature, stable uh, water tests you know, every single week where you know what's going on and keep your hands out of the tank, not adding weird elements, you know, just keep it really, really simple. And then let the tank stabilize because it can take you know, when something goes wrong in my tank and I see what's wrong, I see the corals are not happy or they're really not happy, like the color has changed completely, I know if I can just get things back to its normal ratio that it'll take about 12 weeks till my tank looks right again. I just know. I know i got to wait three months. <laughs> and basically three months later, everything's fine. You would never even know something was wrong. And that is part of the maturity of the hobbyist. So if you are, I mean, there was a, I've talked about this before where my friend Jerry, he, uh, his tank just would never look right. It just constantly had a problem. And then one day I just stumbled into what it was. He was slowing his return pump down to really, really slow at night. And it was like 35%. And so the water was moving up so slowly from the sump that his display tank got really, really cold every single night. And then every day, you know, 8 a.m. or 9 a.m., he sped up the pump to normal speed. And it was normal speed for about six hours and the tank was the right temperature. So the tank was a good temperature for eight hours a day and it was a terrible temperature for 16 hours a day. And that's why his corals are not happy. And once he just left the return pump at the same speed all the time, it was always circulating, it was always the right temperature, all of a sudden things were growing, he was fragging, his anemones were happy. You know, it was just a completely different change and it was all because of some weird stupid setting of one pump. So by simplifying, getting rid of all those bells and whistles, Sometimes you can really dial in the problem and get things stable. And then you can say, okay, I do want to do this. And you say from like 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., I want my pump to make a wave. But that's the only change you make. Everything else is the same. 
then you can see how the tank does. And if you do that kind of stuff, I think you'll find that the tank will become much easier to work on and a lot less effort and a lot less money to throw at it to solve a problem because the problems will be less and less. Uh, Glenn says, when are you going to get the bus tour going again with friends from the club visiting aquarium shops? That, that is something we love doing, but we just can't. We can't take the chance right now. You know, having a bus and having whatever it is, 40, 50 people on that bus for eight hours all day long with COVID going in and out of stores, it's, it's just not possible. We can't have social distancing. And I, it would not be enjoyable sitting on a bus with a mask all day. So we'll just have to wait until things are back to normal when we're all inoculated and safe and they've said they've got this thing under control, then we can look at doing stuff like that again. Angelo, your first time on the stream? Where were you an hour and a half ago? <laughs> I'm glad you're here. I'm really glad you guys enjoyed the Humblefish interview. That was a fun one. I plan to do a couple of other interviews in the near future, and that was just our beta test to see how the software would work. And overall, it worked pretty well. I mean, there were some things I would have liked to have seen better. But uh, I, the one thing I tried not to do once the stream was going was make any changes. Because usually when you start touching stuff and doing stuff, you mess it up. And I don't want to mess up the show for you guys live. So uh, I thought it went well with me at the controls, and uh, he seemed to come through. He, his video was a little choppy, and his audio was a little bit messed up a couple of times. And it turns out he was on Wi-Fi instead of hardwired. And he said, I should have plugged my Ethernet cord. And I was thinking, yes, you should. <laughs> that would have been amazing. It's really important that, you know, everything's right. And so the next person I interview, I'm going to ask, can you be hardwired to the Internet so we know you have a solid signal and we're not taking a chance of losing the person? Uh, Insane Reefer says, when running a calcium reactor, does the pH in the chamber have to stay at the consistent number minus at 6.9? And does that carbon doser need to stay, at a cons stay on consistently for stability? Um, actually, I think you need to watch my calcium reactor video. I mean, you kind of have it right. And you do set a number, like your 6.9, for example. But as your pump is pushing water into the calcium reactor, it's pushing in a higher pH, whatever your tank is. Your tank is 7.9, 8.1, 8.3, 8.5. It's pushing 8.5 into the reactor, and it's forcing out 6.9. So that means in the calcium reactor, the pH will become 7.0. 7.1, 7.2, and then your carbon doser will open up and start releasing CO2 back into the reactor to bring it back down to 6.9. And once it's at 6.9, the carbon doser should turn off, no more CO2 goes in, and again, your tank is pushing in 8.3, and so it brings it up. So usually what happens if you're literally measuring the pH you know, on the fly, you would see as you're staring, it's slow. It's like watching grass grow. But if you were checking on every 10 minutes, you could plot this. Or if you're graphing it in the apex, you could actually see the number of the pH going up and then coming down inside the calcium reactor as the CO2 is opening and closing and as water's pumping in. The water's always going to the reactor all the time from the reef, so it will always be trying to increase that number, and the CO2 is always knocking it back down. And this is a constant thing, and that's how you dissolve the media. And as the meat is dissolving, it is adding the alkalinity to the reef, which goes in the tank, which helps maintain the pH. So it's kind of a really cool uh, tool when you think about it. <laughs> Dennis says, the new NASA is alone in a 55-gallon tank. Uh, I'll give him some nori and just gave him a big chunk of banana. <laughs> I hope he likes it. You know, you just... You don't even have to hold the banana. You can just break it up in your water and just let the pieces blow around and just see how it likes it. But it does seem to work. Wow. Okay, Timothy. Uh, you're probably going to be our last question for the day. It's really a story. He says, I set up continuous water changes on my six-gallon mixed reef with one goby. Can I change too much water? Is that a problem? Things are stabilizing, but phosphates are still high at 0 0.0. 0.6 ppm. Continuous water changes on a six gallon tank? I can't even imagine doing water changes on a six gallon tank. I would ignore that tank to death. <laughs> um, if everything in your new jug of salt water matches your little tank, it doesn't matter how much water you change. But realistically, you only have to change 25% of that water once a month. So it's a six gallon tank. That's 1.5 gallons once a month. 
But if you want to do a gallon every single week, or if you want to do a quarter of a gallon every single day, yeah, I guess if that makes you happy and you like seeing things spinning, yeah, do it. But uh, just make sure that that salt water is correct, that it has the right alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, uh, salinity, temperature. If all that's correct, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Keep an eye on the salinity of your tank because that will change rapidly. On a six gallon tank, that's a nano, it's actually a pico. On that size tank, the uh, salinity and the temperature can get out of control really fast. So you have to stay on top of watching the temperature all the time, which I'm sure you're doing, and check your salinity every single week with a refractometer to verify it's staying where you want it, that it's not getting too salty or it's not getting too, uh, uh, too hypo salinity. We wanna make sure that you have the right number consistently even though it's a little bit of livestock, but yeah, what a tank. That's amazing. Six gallons. I want to see a picture of that. Please post that on Club Mealers Reef. I think we all want to see it. Uh, Club Mealers Reef is a group we have on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash groups slash Mealers Reef. And we've got, I don't know, 9,000 people in there. And it's a group that's designed to help answer your questions, show off your tanks, um, identify things that you don't recognize, uh, discuss things you want to try out, uh, see what others thought of certain products and it's a really good group because we don't allow people to make fun of each other um, if people are being attacked they are thrown out forever so we highly recommend that you are nice and uh, if you're having a bad day don't even visit the group just go i don't know pull weeds out of your yard <laughs> go cute go use that energy for something productive and don't pick fights with people on the internet because it's pointless in the group you'll just lose access and you won't be able to come back so the group is there to be friendly and fun. I like to go in there and just scroll through the comments and see what's going on. And uh, I like seeing what's happening with your tanks. I mean, because you guys get to see mine, but I don't get to see yours as much. So it's always nice to see people using Club Miller's Reef. Um, I started this stream talking about it at the beginning, so I'll mention it here at the end as well. Um, if you haven't, or if you would like to, please shop for Miller's Reef here during the uh, coming weeks. Uh, you might need Christmas gifts for your family. If you've already placed something on order with me recently and you're waiting, I have been dealing with some health issues and I've uh, been dealing with my doctor and you know I've been just super exhausted. And uh, I tested negative for COVID, but <laughs> doesn't necessarily explain why I feel so rotten. So I, I, you know, on top of that, Minion was broken down twice and I got her running again. So there's been some delays. So there's about 15 of you that are waiting on stuff right now. I'm aware of it. And uh, I am on it. I just It's just been really hard to keep up with everything. So I apologize for not being perfect. <laughs> but I do appreciate your business. And uh, the things that are sold in the shop, they're just right off the shelf. They go out quickly because they don't need me to build it. If it's something building of acrylic, there is some waiting. And uh, I do the best I can to fill those orders. And I really appreciate your business and your support. And I love that you guys tune in week after week looking for another live stream, looking for a new topic. So if you would like to let me know what you'd like me to do in a future live stream, you can. If you'd like to let me know someone you'd like me to interview, uh, you can definitely send me the suggestion now that we've tried the software and it worked. Uh, I'd like to get Chad from uh, Reef Nutrition on here, for example. He's such an interesting person. And there's a couple other people I'd like to interview because they're fun. So I, I feel like that's going to happen in the near future and we have something to look forward to. And uh, remember, today is Water Test Saturday. We definitely want to test your water. I've been talking about testing this whole stream. So now I'm going to end with you got to keep testing. <laughs> it's really important you test your water. I've been testing my alkalinity daily for the last week just to make sure things are okay because my alkalinity was getting low. That was another thing. My calcium reactor was low and I had to top it off. And now that I did it and the alkalinity is back where it belongs, I watched my corals just color up almost overnight. So if you are uh, not staying on top of your water testing, you need to do it. You can track it in Reef Trace, which is a great app that works on Android and iOS. And uh, it's got all these cool extra features like the LFS locator, uh, Critter ID is built into there. There's a marketplace built into there. there. The notes section is incredible. If you're trying to track anything you're cleaning or dosing or replacing or uh, just whatever, there's a place to put a note in there. And you can look at it later and remind yourself when you did it, if you replaced a light or, or light bulbs or, I mean, just you name it. If I've tried a new product, like I tried the Smart Spin, I take a picture of it, I put in a note, this is the day I opened my brand new gizmo, you know, and it's just in my notes. It's a super app, it's great, it's available, like I said, for both platforms, and it's really nice for graphing all of our water parameters. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great weekend, and I will see you in another week. Oh, wait, there's more questions. <laughs> there's more questions. Let me see what we got here.
Uh, Dennis says, where is the seven-year anniversary video? Well, I told you I was sick, so it's been kind of on hold. Matter of fact, when we were filming part of it, I was sick during the filming. <laughs> but uh, yeah, what I'd like to do is kind of get things a little cleaned up and do my full overview of the tank, and then that'll go on to the end of what I've already filmed, and we'll have a nice seven-year anniversary video. Last year's video came out on January 1st. This one, maybe I can get it out in early December. Um, I would have loved to get it out the day it happened, but that just wasn't realistic. So, uh, Pappy says, are there any tips or tricks to removing zoas or on Acropora? Usually it's a matter of peeling those off. You want to be careful, and uh, you may break your acros in the process. The trick is not to put them anywhere near Acropora. And... Oh, that's a good one. Uh, Dean suggested interviewing David Saxby of London. He's uh, got a beautiful reef tank. It's a monster tank. It's super famous. It's been featured everywhere. And uh, that would be a really cool one. Oh, I've got some more videos to edit, too. I haven't had any time to sit at my computer and edit videos. I say that all the time, but it's true. All right, I'm going to let you go. i got some work to get done today. And uh, I hope you guys have a great weekend. You stay safe, and I'll see you next Saturday. Bye.